So I'm just going to do a little bit of a recap about what we did last time and how we've already seen these ideas and how all of these ideas come together, right? So the last time we talked about independence of vectors, right? And we were wondering what does it mean for vectors to be independent, right? And so I gave you a definition of independence. We first started off with a rough um, idea of what linear independence is, and then we gave a systematic um, definition is that we say that there are some vectors which are linearly independent if their linear combination is only zero when all of the scalars, right? So these are vectors v1, v2, v3, vn. And we say, when we say linearly independent, we're talking about the entire set of vectors v1 to vn, right? And we say that v1 to vn are linearly independent. If their linear combination is zero, if and only if all of the scalars are zero, right? There is, in other words, we are saying there is no other way we can change these scalars, right? Make this five and make this three, and then still get the zero vector on the right hand side, right? So the linear combination is gives the zero vector if and only if all of these scalars involved are zero. And we settled on that definition because um, it told us that if this is true, then there is no way that one of them can be written as a linear combination of the others, right? And that's something that we don't want, that one of the vectors is a linear combination of the others. And then at the end of the last lecture, I connected that idea to the idea of, let's say we say that C1 to Cn are linearly independent, right? Are linearly independent. And now if I see these vectors C1 to Cn as the columns of a matrix A, right? So if I make an M by N matrix, I said, this is my matrix. I had some vectors and I just put them side by side as columns of A, right? And we saw that if I try to solve now AX equals to zero, then if they are linearly independent, that means that I'll only get the trivial solution in this case, right? In other words, what do I mean? When I say that AX equals to zero only has a trivial solution, it means that the null space, the null space only contains the zero vector, right? What's the null space? Let me just remind you that the null space is just a word that we've given to the solution, solutions of AX equals to zero, right? So that's the null space of A. And when AX equals to zero only has a trivial solution, we say that there is only one vector um, in the null space. And these null space, we call it a space because if you combine these vectors, we've seen that it makes a vector space, right? It satisfies, um, vector addition and scalar multiplication, all of, all of those nice things, right? So now this is the connection that I ended the last lecture at, right? And notice here that there is no special consideration of the size of A. This is true regardless of the size of A. It can be an M by N matrix, right? So the only, um, so if you're taking N vectors, N column vectors, then you know that there are going to be N columns, right? N columns because you took n column vectors. But the number of rows depends on how many, how many entries each vector has, right? In other words, where are these vectors coming from? So maybe C1 or right, a general vector CI is something like zero, one, two, three, right? So in this case, it's going to be a four by n matrix, right? Because it has each, row will correspond to one of the entries of each of the CI, yeah, right? So let's say CI is from A, B, C, D, right? So it has four entries, or maybe it can have M entries, right? So let's say it has A1, A2, up until AM, M entries. And that gives me the number of, uh, that gives me the size of this matrix. But regardless of whatever the size of this matrix is, we're going to have this fact that when the columns are linearly independent, AX equals to zero is only going to have a trivial solution, right? And this is the same as just saying 
that when I do Gaussian elimination, that when I perform Gaussian elimination, then Gaussian elimination will not give me any free variables, right? So remember that when we were doing Gaussian elimination, free variables gave me more solutions to the null space, which means there are going to be no free variables. This, all of this is connected, okay? Okay, so we're, we're going to come back to this fact in a bit. Or maybe there's, we can just, Think about this. So, for example, if there's going to be no free variables, then what can I say? I can say that the matrix, if if there are no free variables, that means all of the columns have pivots, right? So, if there are n columns, if there are n columns, then I must have n pivots, because if I don't have a pivot in a column, that will give me a free variable which will mess all of this picture up because as soon as I get a free variable I know that the null space will start getting infinitely many solutions right this is something that we've seen when we were discussing how many vectors the null space has right so n pivots which means um, the rank should be equal to n okay so for linear independence matrix A should have rank equal n So let me just uh, take this picture and let me remind you that this is something that we did in lecture 2.2. I drew this, uh, I wrote up these different sentences and we were at that time just dealing with an N by N matrix. And I said all of this and at that time the conversation was a bit intuitive. I did not give you definition of linear independence. Um, we didn't even know what the null space was. But even then, we had some idea of some way of talking about these ideas, right? So, and the and the uh, discussion that we had was for an n by n matrix. And notice that this is something that we've already discussed. That when a x equals to zero has only the trivial solution, the columns of a are linearly independent. So even then, even when we did not have the definition of linear independence, we knew that we can at least think about these things, right? And now, so the above discussion was for an M by N matrix. If you restrict it, so in this case, M can be greater than N or M can be equal to N or M can be even less than N, right? But if we restrict to a square matrix, then we get all of these conditions as well. So when AX equals to zero has a trivial solution, we know that the inverse is going to exist, right? We know that the, um, we know that the AX equals to B is going to have only the unique solution. We know that rows of A are also linearly independent. This is something that we just did it hand wavy in a hand wavy way. And this is something that perhaps will come up in the next lecture. So we're going to put a little star here because this is going to be important. But also notice that when I say AX equals to zero only has the trivial solution, maybe I can just add one more statement at the end of it. I can just say that the null space only contains the zero vector, that's the null space. So it's, it's called the trivial null space, okay? All right. And what else? Maybe I can also say that it's going to have rank. The rank of A is equal to N, right? So it's going to have N pivots. Let me just uh, fix the size of this. Okay, so we sort of expanded this list here, right? So the rank of A is going to be N, null space only contains a zero vector. This is the same, six and four are essentially, uh, sorry, two and six are essentially the same thing. Okay, but we just have a greater vocabulary to talk about these things now. Okay, so that was sort of the discussion that we were having up until the last lecture. Okay, so this, these are the things that we've put together uh, as we've talked about these things. So let's go and now talk about 
let's let's do an example today so here's an example okay so here's a question v1 let me just write down some vectors one two three and v2 is one 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 and v3 is two three five and v4 is one zero one okay so we have these four vectors and let's ask a simple question are these are these vectors linearly independent okay so just think about this one way to think about this is that this is each of these vectors have three entries which means there's these vectors v1 v2 v3 v4 all of them are coming from the three dimensional space okay and and the other thing is that there are there are four vectors four vectors these are four vectors in r3 right so something is telling us that these are probably not going to be linearly independent because we we saw that if if you think about it visually if you have a three dimensional space then you're probably only going to and i use the word dimension even though it's not defined it but we've sort of been using it right um and today we'll define what dimension even means but think about this space r3 right it immediately sort of something tells you that these are not going to be linearly independent because it something tells me that one of them can be written as the linear combination of the other right but how do we know for sure how do we check how do we check and the answer is simple the answer is this little fact that we discovered in the last lecture which was linear independence is going to happen when ax equals to zero only has this little solution right so take these vectors v1 to v4 and put them in a so let me just zoom out for a little bit so that i can make this matrix and i'll zoom back in right so one two three let me just put these vectors into columns of a matrix two three five and one zero one okay and now we can zoom back again okay so here's a little um, here's the matrix a and v1 to v4 are the columns of a right and now the way that we check is to say that ax equals to zero so x1 x2 x3 and i have to put a fourth entry x4 because it has four columns is going to be equal to zero this this system that i have to solve ax equals to zero ax equals to zero if it has only trivial solution then i know that v1 to v4 are independent otherwise otherwise they are dependent okay so now the question has changed from checking whether these vectors are independent the question has checked how uh, the question has now turned into checking how many solutions does this system have x1 um, ax equals to zero right and so what do we do how do we solve systems right we do gaussian elimination we do gaussian elimination and let's not even do gaussian elimination let's just think what gaussian elimination will give us notice that this is a three this matrix has three rows and four columns right so a a is three by four which means it is n by n such that m is less than n right that it has more variables than equations then i immediately i immediately can conclude that even if even if i get 
pivots in the first column and pivot in the second column and pivot in the third column, there is no possible way for me to get a fourth pivot because I run out of rows, right? Which means no matter, I don't know if I'll get these three pivots even. I'm, I might get two pivots, I get one pivot, but at max, I'm going to get only three pivots, right? Which means the rank of this matrix is the maximum rank of this matrix can be M. And that rank is always going to be less than equal to N, right? Which means at least, at least X4 is free. And that's a problem. That's a problem because immediately as soon as you have a free variable, you get non-trivial, non-trivial solution to AX equals zero. <clears throat> And that's and that's it. We don't even need to check anymore. We that's all that we need to do. We needed to do because as soon as I get non-trivial solutions to AX equals to zero, I know that non-trivial solutions to AX equals to zero immediately will mean that columns of A are not linearly independent, right? Because for them to be linearly independent, I should have only gotten the trivial solution. Which means I can conclude that V1, V2, V3, V4 are linearly dependent, right, dependent. Okay, so that was easy. That's an important fact that we've just realized that when we have, we have, let's say, n vectors in R, M such that N is greater than M, right? That's, that's what we were doing, right? We had N vectors. We had N vectors in RM. Then, then the vectors are linearly, are linearly dependent. So we don't even need to check, right? This is something like saying that let's say I have a two dimensional space and if I have three vectors in that space, right? If I have three vectors in a two dimensional space, I know for sure that only two of them are going to be linearly independent because as soon as I get two linearly independent vectors, I can cover the entire space, which means this vector is just going to be a linear combination of the other two. Okay, so at this point, let's define a new thing. Let's define something called the span, right? And we say, we say the span of a set of vectors, of a set of vectors, V1, V2, Vn is the Space, or do I say space? is let's just say is the space covered by all linear combinations, linear combinations of these vectors. Okay, what does that mean? Let's let's talk about one vector, right? Let's take one vector, V one one vector. Well, if the vector is, let's say, non-zero vector, right, then the span of this vector, if I take all possible linear combinations, then its span is going to be this line. Okay, so if it's non-zero, if it's non-zero, then the span of that vector is going to be a line, but if it's a zero vector, then the span is just going to be, it's going to be a point. Okay, let's, let's take two vectors. Let's take two vectors. So what's the span of two vectors? Well, one possibility is that if both of them are in the same line, let's say this is V1 and V2 is also in the same direction, let's say this, then their span 
is going to be this line. This is their span, right? But if they're in two dimensions, if they're an independent vectors, if they're going in sort of different directions, then their span is going to be this entire spaces, this two dimensional. Okay, so that's another possibility for the span of two vectors. Okay. What about three vectors? What about, what if I add another vector in this space, right? Let's say I take a third vector, let's, let's copy this. Let's copy this. And if I take a third vector, but now the third vector, what I'm taking, what I'm doing, is the third vector is also within this plane, then what's the span? The span remains the same, right? Because if you take all linear combinations, the span is still, the span is still the space. This is the span. Okay, so this is, this is the span, right? Okay, even for these three vectors. And the reason is this third vector did not add anything else to this space, right? So that's one possibility. And the other possibility is, of course, what if the first two were in a line and the third vector was then outside the line? Then even in that case, we get maybe, let's say, a different sort of a plane, right? Where the first two were in the same direction, but the third one was in a different direction. In which case, again, we get a two-dimensional plane, maybe a different two-dimensional plane. But um, still, uh, we just get this plane. But, however, if I get three vectors that are independent, right? So first vector, let's say, goes in this direction, and the second vector, second vector goes this direction, and they form a plane, and then the third vector goes in completely different direction. Then we get sort of this uh, third space, right? So this entire space. And if we add another another space, which we just can't visualize, right? So let's see what happens. But in this case now, let's just use the idea of independence, right? So in this case, when you had, notice that when you had one vector, this was the set of vectors V1, let's call this V1, is independent, right? So when there is one vector and it's independent, it spans a line, okay? But if you have two vectors, but they still span a line, then there we know that these are dependent, right? So V1, V2 are dependent, right? But as soon as you make them independent, then you get a different space, right? So in this case, V1, V2 are independent, okay? Right, in this case, what's happening? In this case or in this case, V1, V2, V3 are dependent, right? Because they're spanning just a plane. And in other words, V3 can be written as a linear combination of V1 and V2. But in this case, we have V1, V2, V3 are independent, right? So we're sort of building towards this next idea, which is called the basis. So now think about this. Think about this space. Now forget about the vector. Think about this space, this line. Think about this plane. Think about this well, R3 space, or let's call it, you know, um, 3D space, or a cube maybe, right? Infinitely large. Think about how many vectors we would need to, you know, um, at least the minimum sort of vectors. So think about it like this. The minimum vector that I need, minimum independent vector that I need is just one. I can have two, but I don't really need the second vector. As long as I have one independent vector, I'm fine, I have a line, okay? Similarly, as long as I have two independent vectors, I can get a plane. As soon as I have a three, I have three independent vectors, I can get this whole of R3, okay? All right. So the idea that I'm building towards is the 
idea of a basis, right? What's the basis of a vector space? So we're saying the basis of a vector space, right? And the idea is as follows. The basis of a vector space is a set of vectors. The set of vectors, let's say V1 to Vn gives, let's make it into a set, right? Gives the basis of a vector space V, let's call that vector space V, if we have two conditions, right? So think about these three vector spaces. In this case, this line is a vector space. This plane through the origin is a vector space. This uh, R3 space is a vector space, right? And so let's think about these vector space and the idea of a basis of these vector spaces is that these vectors, the span, the span of V1 to Vn is V. That is when you take all possible linear combination of these vectors, they give you the whole space. And the second condition is that the vectors are linearly independent, right? Okay, so let's let's go back. So we have two conditions to satisfy to get a basis for a vector space. They should be linearly independent and their span should be the whole space. So now the question is, is V1 a basis for this line? Absolutely, right? So V1, so let's call this S, right? Let's call this S, this line, let's call this L. And let's and we can say that V1 is a basis for L. Okay. But in this case, we have two vectors. They are spanning the line, but the problem is that they are dependent vectors. So V1, V2 is not a basis for let's say this line, let's call this L2 for L2, right? Let's say this is L2. Okay, what about this plane? Let's call this plane P, and I can say that V1, V2 are a basis for this plane one, right? So let's call this plane one. They're a basis because there are two vectors, they're linearly independent and they're spanning. So their basis, um, their basis because they're independent vectors and they're spanning this whole plane. Okay, what about these ones? Are they spanning the plane? Yes, so P3 is being spanned by these three vectors. Are they independent? No. So V1, V2, V3 are not, so R is not a basis for P3, sorry, P2 or P3, right? Let's call this P2 and this is P3. And finally, I can say, let's call this space F, right? Let's call this space F. And I can say that these three vectors, because they're independent and they're spanning the whole space, then V1, V2, V3 is a basis for F, okay? All right, so that's the definition of a basis. And let's, we're going to do some examples immediately so that <clears throat> it becomes clear what the ideas are. So let's talk about R2. One, the first example that I can think of is one, zero, zero, one, right? And the question is, <clears throat> are they independent? <clears throat> I was saying that these two vectors give me a basis for R2, these two vectors we're going to think about now and this is going in the x direction and the other vector is going in not the same direction it's going in some other direction so I believe I can combine them so this is one vector and now <clears throat> I get a sense that I can combine them to get me the entire 
three dimension the two dimension space right so i'm still going to cover the whole space if i take linear combination so these are also a basis for r2 okay next if i take this vector just this one zero can this form a basis for r2 one vector I know is just not going to be enough. It's just going to stay in this line. Even if I take another vector that is in some other direction, it's going to be stuck in this its own line, right? So one, zero, and if I take another example, two, two, then this is not a basis. And this is also not a basis for R2. Not a basis for R2, okay. What are they a basis for? Well, if I think about this line, if I call this line L1, then I can say one zero is a basis for L1. And if I call this L2, then I can say that two two is a basis of L2. Because if you just think about this line, then one vector is linearly independent, yes. Um, and the problem in both of these cases was not that they were that they were dependent. They are independent vectors because one vector is not a dependent vector. But the problem is they were not able. They were not enough vectors to cover the two-dimensional space. Okay. And now finally, let's look at one more example. Let's say this is one, two, and two, four. And I can see that one, two is going to be a vector like this. And then two four is going to be another vector in the same line. So this is again is not a basis for R two. And if I call this line L three, then it's not a basis for L three either. Why? In the first case, it doesn't span. Doesn't span R two. These two vectors combined, V one and V two, they don't combined together to give me the whole R2 space. And in the second problem, they're not independent. So they're neither a basis for R2, they're neither a basis for L3, right? So these are the different cases that you can have. Let's, let's do some other examples. Let's think about R3, right? So R3, the first example is, of course, immediately you can take the standard basis Right, we call these the standard bases, which are in the direction of the x and y axis, right? And these are in three dimensions, it's going to be one, zero, zero, and zero, one, zero, and zero, zero, one. And I know that this is a basis, is a basis for R3, absolutely, no question about it. Okay, if I take one, 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 and Mm, one, two, three, then I have just two vectors. Sure, they might be linearly independent, but I know they're not going to be enough to cover R3, so this is not a basis for R3. Okay, another example perhaps, let's say one, 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 and one, two, three and two, three, four. Okay, what about this one? What do you think? If you think about in terms of linear combinations, right? If they, so I do have enough vectors, but I don't have independent vectors. And the reason I don't have independent vectors is because the third vector was cleverly created just from these two vectors, right? So, well, not cleverly, there's nothing clever about this. It's just adding the entries, right? So one plus one, two, one plus two, three, and one plus three, four. So this V3 can be written as V1 plus V2, right? And when that's the case, and so V3 is equals to V1 plus V2, and now I can say V1 plus V2 minus V3 is equals to zero, and you can see that alpha one is one, alpha two is one, and alpha three is minus one, which means they are dependent right for vectors to be independent all of these for their linear combination to be zero all of these 
should have been zero but i found some non-zero entries that give me the zero linear combination which means that this is not so this is not a basis for r3 because they are dependent vectors okay so i was saying that these three vectors are they dependent or independent and the problem is that they are dependent vectors and the reason is that I can just add the first two vectors together and get the third vector, right? When I do this, when I say V1 plus V2 gives me V3, I can write them like this, and then I can change them to V1 plus V2 minus V3, and this is telling me that alpha 1 plus alpha, sorry, it's telling me alpha 1 V1 plus alpha 2 V2 plus alpha 3 V3 is zero even though even though alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 are not all 0, right? When you have that, that's the definition of independence, right? The definition of dependence was that when their linear combination is 0, all of them, the scalars, should be 0. But I have non-zero scalars. 1, 1, and minus 1, for which this linear combination gives me the zero vector. Therefore, they are dependent and they don't form a basis for R3. Okay? So, if we combine all of these examples together, we've sort of developed some key facts now. The fact is, there can be many bases. There are many bases for the same vector space, right? For example, um, so here I gave you just this one example, but I can give you another example, right? I can give you example four, which is one zero zero and one one zero and one one one. And you can check that these are linearly independent. And I know for sure that they're going to span R3, right? So that's the first thing. There are many bases for the same vector space, but however, they have something in common. And what is this? The basis, the different bases Basis for a vector space for a vector space will have the same number the same number of vectors right we saw that in this case in R3 the two bases that we had both of them had three vectors right for it to be a basis it needs to have three vectors in the case of R2 Notice that this was a basis and it had two vectors. This was a basis that had two vectors. Less than two, not even a question, it's not going to be a basis, right? But you have two vectors which are dependent, then even then you don't get a basis. So the common thing in different bases for the same vector space is that they're going to have the same number of vectors, okay? All right, so this gives us the idea to define something and now i have shamelessly used this word several times even without defining it and the reason i used it is because we had some idea of it but now i'm going to define the term dimension okay and so the dimension the dimension of a vector space vector space v is the number of vectors in the basis of V, right? So for example, R2 I know, so we're just defining the term dimension using this idea of basis, that the dimension is equal to the number of bases, the number of vectors that you need, sorry, <clears throat> the number of vectors that you need to cover that entire space, right? So R2 we know 
can have bases such as one zero, zero one, right? That's the basis, but it has it needs to have two vectors, right? So that's the dimension of R two. That's where it's coming from. And R three, we know it needs three vectors in the bases. In the bases, right? So bases is plural in each of the bases. And so that's where the dimension of R3 is coming from. Okay. All right. Let me just say one thing about the dimension. And the, the, that one thing is that a space is called finite dimension, finite dimensional space. If the number of vectors, if the number of vectors in its in its basis in its basis is finite, for example, consider R n. I know that this is a finite dimensional space because I can find one. So R n is made up of vectors which look like this, right? V one, V two dot 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 v n <clears throat> and I immediately can find the standard basis vector, right? Let me make a basis for this. The first vector is going to be one and all zeros. The second vector is going to be zero and one and then all zeros again. So this is this is zero 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 dot 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 zero, right? This is zero one then zero zero dot 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 zero. And this is the first vector, this is the second vector, and then I can make all of the n vectors. So 0, 0, dot, 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 0, and then 1. And this is the nth vector. And now this gives me a basis for Rn. So this is the basis for Rn, which means Rn, the dimension, the dimension for Rn is just n, which means this is a finite dimensional space finite dimensional space. But there are spaces that are infinite dimensional, right? So an infinite infinite dimensional space is the space in which the basis vectors there are you require need infinitely many vectors in its basis. Right? So, for example, if you consider R infinity, right? For example, which means each of the there are each of the vectors in R infinity has infinitely many entries. It just keeps going on. This vector is of infinite length, which means I can't find a finite dimensional basis for this. I can the first basis vector can be this equal to one and the rest zeros, but I'll have to put a one in each and every one of them, right? So, this doesn't seem like it's going to be n a finite dimensional space, okay? So there can be infinite dimensional spaces. Okay. So now let's look at once more the example. Let's look at an example. And here we're going to look at the dimension. We're going to look at the dimension of the column space of A. Okay. All right. So let's consider a, vec a matrix A, which is the following. This is 1, 2, 3, and 2, 1, 3. And let's make another vector 3, 3, 6, and another one. One, two, three. Okay. All right. First and foremost, I know that this has three rows, four columns. The dimension, of course, cannot be. This is an R3, right? All of these vectors, consider C1, C2, C3, C4. Then the column space of A consists of all linear combinations, right? It's alpha 1, C1 plus alpha 2, C2. It contains of all these vectors, alpha 3, C3 plus alpha 
so it could work. Now, if you're in R3, it, each of them has three entries and you have four, the dimension has to be either equal to three or it has to be less than or equal to three because if these are three dimensional vectors, right? If they're in R3, then the best that I can hope for is that they end up giving me R3. That's the best I can hope for because the other diamond, the other vector is still in the same space, right? All of these vectors are in this space, right? These are four vectors and so they can't be linearly independent. So that's something I know off the bat that the dimension cannot be equal to four. It has to be equal to three or less than three. And how do I find how many independent vectors I have? We can check that by doing Gaussian elimination and finding the number of number of pivots will tell me the number of the number of independent, independent vectors, okay? So here we go. So let's do some Gaussian elimination. So let's do R2. Let's take this, do some Gaussian elimination on this. Okay, so the first thing that I can see is even before I do Gaussian elimination is that this column and this column are the same column. So this is a copy of this. That means this column is not an independent column, right? So this is C1, C2, C3, C4. I can just get rid of C4 from my list because C1 is the same as C4, okay? For C2, for C3, notice that C3 is just C1 plus C2. So I can also get rid of C3 from my list, which means I get only two independent vectors, right? But we can do this also systematically. So let's do that. Let's do R2 minus two times R1, and let's do R3 minus three times R1. So let's do this Gaussian elimination. So first stays preserved. Second one, two minus two, zero. One minus four, minus three. 3 minus 6 minus 3, right? 3 minus 6, of course, minus 3, and 2 minus 4 minus 2. Okay, and the second one, 3 minus 3, 0. 3 minus, what is it? 3 minus 6 gives me minus 3. Yeah, 1 minus, yeah, I think it gives me minus 3. And then 6 minus nine gives me minus three again. And then three minus three gives me zero, I believe. Is that true? No, I made some mistakes. So three minus three times one. What does that give me? Three minus three gives me zero. I mean, two minus two, this one should have given me zero as well, right? So two minus two, this was zero. Okay. So now I can just do R3 plus R2, and that gives me 1, 2, 3, 1, 0, minus 3, minus 3, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, sorry, R3 minus R2. So now I see that I have two pivots, and that's exactly what I ex expected, right? I expected two, free two pivot variables, two independent vectors. So this tells me that the rank that the rank is equal to two, and the number of the number of independent vectors is also equal to two, which means if I combine all four of them, one of them is in, so let's say this one is in this direction, the second one is in some other direction, but the rest of the two of them are in this space covered by the two of them, right? This third vector was dependent on these two. This fourth vector was also dependent on these two, which means I have just this two-dimensional space. So the dimension, the dimension of the column space of A is also equal to two. So here's something that we can say. We say that the rank of A is equal to the number of pivot variables which is equal to the number of independent 
column and which is also equal to the dimension, the dimension of the column space of A. Okay. Um, dun, dun, dun. Maybe we can do an example, right? So if you think about this, let me just show you how this is A spaces, right? So let me take this, this step, and let me show you that this is a linearly independent set, right? So my claim was that this is a linearly, this is linearly independent. And one way of showing that is to sh show that AX equals to zero has trivial solution, which is the same as saying there are no free variables. And that's actually very easy to see, right? So if I make a matrix out of these vectors, so the first vector is one, zero, zero, the second one is one, one, zero, the third one is one, one, one. And now if I want to think about doing Gaussian elimination on it, I don't have to do it. It's already done for me. There are three pivots. It's already in what we call the echelon form, right? So first pivot, everything below it zero, second pivot, zero, and the third pivot, zero, right? Third pivot, we have three pivots. We have no free variable. It was three by three, so A was N by N, which was three by three, and the rank is equals to three, which is equals to N, the number of columns. So it has full column rank, which means there are no free variables, which means, of course, AX equals to zero has only trivial solution. And if you want to see that, again, once more, if you want to see why AX equals to zero has the trivial solution, let's just augment it, right? So we have one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, 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 augment it with zero, and let's just read all these equations together. So the last equation is telling me this is x1, x2, x3. This equation is telling me x3 is equal to zero. Good. The second equation is telling me x2 plus x3 is equal to zero. Since x3 is zero, I know that x2 is also zero. And finally, the first equation is telling me x1 plus x2 plus x3 is equal to zero which of course means that x1 is equal to zero. So three pivots, linear independence of the columns, and trivial solution. So Ax equals to zero only has trivial solution. <coughs> These ideas almost will become natural for you because they're just at the core of it, you can start to think that it's just the same idea, but you're looking at it from many different perspectives. You're looking at it from matrices, you're looking at it from vectors and you know vector spaces and null spaces. But at the end of the day, that idea is that's just one idea where you're interpreting it in different ways. Right? And that's actually the core of linear algebra, that, that main idea, right? Okay. What about this one? Let's say I want to see that one, two, three. Let's check whether these are independent or not, right? Let's question. This is a claim that we made that these two are linearly independent. We can check that, right? Okay, so let's say this is my, these are my vectors, and let's try to see are they, are they independent? So in this case, I'm taking an M by N case where M is greater than N. So one, two, three, two, one, three. Let's try to solve the system for zero, zero, zero. Okay, so here's, the, here's what we do. We do Gaussian elimination on it. Let's not augment the zero, zero to it. Let's just do R2 minus two R1 and R3 minus three R1. So I get one, two, this one becomes two minus two, zero. One minus four, minus three. Three minus one is zero. And 
3 minus, what do we have here? 3 minus 6 or minus 2. Okay, that's something we have. And I can take it one more step further. I can do R3 minus R2, and I get 1, 0, 0, 2 minus 3, and 0, 2. So I have a pivot. I have another pivot. So I have two pivots, right? And so this was x1, this was x2. So what are these equations telling me? Let's read off these equations. Let's again try to solve these equations, right? 1, 2, 0, minus 3. I can augment the 0 vector back in, right? Remember, I can do this because nothing really happens to this right-hand side. If this was non-zero, I would not have been able to do this, and I would have needed to do Gaussian elimination on this as well. So this is x1. This is x2. What's the last equation telling me? The last equation is telling me 0x1 plus 0x2 is equal to 0, which is 0 equals to 0. Fine. It's not a contradiction, at least, so we're fine. The second equation is telling me minus 3x2 is equal to 0, which means x2 equals to 0. OK, checks out. And this equation is telling me x1 plus 2x2 equals to 0. I already know that the second variable is 0, so x1 is also 0. So again, I can see that ax equals to 0 only has trivial solution, trivial solution, which is what's that solution? That solution is just uh, 0, 0, right? That's the solution. This is x1, x2. OK, that's about it. I think we are set. That's a good example to end the lecture at.